Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hamad Zamani, and uh, I'm a faculty at UMass. It's my pleasure to host uh, King Yun Cho here with us today. Uh, he's an associate professor of computer science and data science at the New York University. And he's also a CPAR fellow of learning in machines and brains. Um, before that, he was also a research scientist at Facebook AR Research uh, from 2017 to 2020. Um, and before, before becoming the faculty, he was doing a postdoc at the University of Montreal with uh, Joshua Bengio. And he received his uh, PhD and master's degrees uh, from the Alto University. Um, I think many of you know that his uh, kind of, he has played a central role in making several breakthroughs in deep learning research and um, most importantly in neural, uh, neural machine translations. And um, it's our pleasure to have him with us today. And without further ado, I'd like to ask you to start talking to us about online hyperparameter tuning uh, towards real time hyperparameter learning. Uh, thank you very much for invitation as well as a very generous introduction. And today uh, I was thinking about you know, the, what is going to be the most interesting topic that I can talk about at this seminar series, which at least the name suggested is very focused on the information retrieval. And then I was looking at you know, some of my recent work as well. But you know, last week I got really excited about our submission to ICM or the International Conference of Machine Learning done together by with my collaborator Christina Sabin, who's a professor of neuroscience here, and also the my PhD student Daniel Im. Uh, and the reason why I got really excited about this in recent month or so, I was I started to feel that the one of the things that we haven't done well as a machine learning or generally more AI faculty members or the research scientists is that we haven't really talk too much about or emphasize, uh, haven't emphasized enough about the nature of the feedback loop in the deployment systems and then how that actually does break down most of the assumptions that we use in machine learning. And then one of the things that the, we, the, one of the, let's say, kind of big assumptions that we use is that the things don't change. But then as soon as we deploy systems, things change because of the systems themselves or you know because the world changes. And then what is the right way to build a machine learning algorithm to handle that has, has not been studied well enough, I think it requires more attention. And then you know, the, this work that is really fresh out of the oven, we haven't even had time to unload the preprint archive yet, is in fact one small kind of step that uh, me and my group ha I have started to take in order to tackle this issue of the offline nature of the, a lot of the research surrounding machine learning, information retrieval, as well as the other adjacent field. So it's going to have a talk. It's going to be a talk with many rough edges, but if you bear with me, then at the end, you might see that, yeah, oh, why I'm excited about this whole thing. So in particular, I'm going to focus on deep learning and then, you know, focusing on deep learning is not a bad idea these days when we talk about the machine learning algorithms or the any adjacent field or the applications because deep neural nets do tend to be used in many different areas and the, as a different components or sometimes the end-to-end -end models. And then building a good deep neural network tends to give us the good improvements on the task performance, even with a lot of the caveats. And in one of the key things, key components in deep learning is optimization. So once we prepare a set of neural network architectures, as well as the different, let's say, models, and then you know, once we collect the data, and then once we define these per example, so-called per example loss functions, we actually go into a two stages of optimization. First one is given a new network architecture and some of the, uh, uh, you know, given a hypothesis, hypothesis space, what is the model or the configuration of the parameters that, are, that, that can solve the problem really, really well using a training set. So that's the second stage of training. The third stage is the model selection where the goal is that the, once we have all those models trained from the second stage, how do we decide which model to use? And then that's often called the validation step in many of the research, uh, research papers. Of course, we have the fourth step where we finally reveal and report the test error or the test performance, but I'm not going to talk about that much. Only thing that I want to emphasize is that we have to really strive to minimize looking at the test accuracies as much as we can, which is a bit difficult when there is a 
conference deadline every two months, but you know, we really should try our best not to do so. So uh, in optimization, as in training, the most widely used uh, technique oops, uh, is so-called stochastic gradient descent. And you know, the, to do so, we need to first define a empirical risk function that consists of two terms. The first term is the sum of the per example loss functions over the entire training set, now divided by the size of the training set. And in this per example loss function, what we are comparing is the ground truth label Y against the prediction made by our neural network or any kind of classifier, as a matter of fact, F that was parametrized with the theta. So I'm going to refer to theta as the network parameters from here on because I want to talk about the, uh, I want to contrast it against hyperparameters soon. And then the second term is the so-called uh, differentiable regularizer. It doesn't have to be differentiable, but we know that the, if our objective function is not differentiable, it just makes our life so much more complicated. And even if we have a regularizer that is not differentiable on its own, we often can find a very tight proxy, differentiable proxy to it. So I'm going to just stick to this notion that we always use the differentiable, for example, loss function and differentiable regularizer. Now then stochastic gradient descent simply boils down to coming up with a iterative optimization procedure or the iterative of the procedure. So we start with the current network parameters and then compute the update direction, which I'm going to refer to as Delta, which is a function of the current network parameter theta and a mini batch of training examples. So small randomly selected training instances. And then this Delta is computes the update direction and it has its own parameters, which I'm going to refer to as the optimization hyperparameters often throughout the talk. And then those optimization hyperparameters lambda includes, for instance, learning rate and regularization coefficients. But if you decided to use more sophisticated uh, optimizers such as Adam or Ada Delta or whatnot, then you end up with a bunch more hyper optimization hyperparameters such as momentums. And then there's a momentum A, momentum B, you know, you can imagine you know, all those things. And then that's, those are essentially the things that you need to pass as an option to the PyTorch's optimization routine. So then you know, the, in the case of a very simple stochastic gradient descent, it's going to be just computing the gradient for each of the examples, average them, and then add the gradient of the differential wall regularizer. So far, so good. Now, one interesting thing that people have noticed in recent years is that the choice of these optimization hyperparameters, in fact, decide where in the parameter space our solution is going to end up in. What that means is that the, we are thinking about a gigantic volume of the parameter space, which we can reach within a some reasonable time frame. But it turned out that the what kind of optimization hyperparameters we use, such as what kind of learning rate we choose, what kind of regularization coefficient we choose, in fact, determine which subset of this space we are going to end up in. What that means is that the, until now, when we think about the model selection or the hyperparameter search, we've been thinking about, oh, we need to decide on the network architecture, number of layers, number of neurons, what kind of activation functions we are going to use and so on. But it turned out that even when the network architecture is completely fixed, simply changing the optimization hyperparameter little, in fact, changes the space over which we run this training or the optimization. And then you know, this is supported by the recent findings from on the implicit regularization of stochastic gradient descent, as well as some of the findings that show that it's really important set to, to set the hyperparameters very, very carefully in the early stage of training. So what the reason why I'm talking about this is that I'm going to almost exclusively focus on optimization hyperparameters today, although uh, ultimately it's going to be possible to work with even how the network looks like in the future. Now then model selection, assuming that we are going to only talk about this optimization hyperparameters, model selection is also in some sense an empirical risk minimization, except that we're not, we not going to use a training set, but we're going to use a validation set. And then we're not going to start from some random theta value, but we are always going to use the network parameter that was the result of minimizing the empirical risk, risk uh, computed using the training examples. So I, it's a mouthful, but essentially what I'm saying is that if we're going to train a model a lot of times with a different optimization hyperparameters and then choose the one that has the best or the lowest loss, function, loss value according to the validation set. And because evaluating each point in this space that is at the 
given a set of uh, configuration of hyperparameters, now what is the corresponding validation loss? So this evaluate, because this evaluation is very expensive, as you can imagine, you can just train the entire network. It's often approached as a black box optimization problem. That is that if we don't know what, this inter uh, what the insurance of this function, this mapping is, we just want to ensure that we can find the input configuration that's going to minimize the value of this black box while minimizing the number of evaluations. Makes sense. And then that's what we do with the hyperparameter search. And one of the most widely used uh, black box optimization algorithm for the particular purpose of hyperparameter search in deep learning is grid search. It's the dumbest way you can imagine. So we're going to look at the volume of the hyperparameters. So it's a hyper volume of the hyperparameters. We're going to make a grid that's often log uniformly spaced in this hyper volume of the hyperparameters. And then we're going to try every single point on this grid. And then it's really easy to use because it's already implemented in scikit-learn. And then once you know that it's implemented in scikit-learn, you know that it's a, one of the standard approaches. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, it does not scale well with the number of hyperparameters because the number of points that we need to inspect or evaluate grows exponentially with the number of hyperparameters. Instead, in 2012, James Bergstra and Yasha Benjo noticed a weird phenomenon. It's that the, given the same amount of the computational budget, that is the number of evaluations or the model training that was allowed, it was much better to simply test randomly selected points in this hyperparameter space rather than all the points on the grid. They had you know, a lot of the interesting intuition why that is so, but effectively what it's saying is that the, in order to identify the important point in this uh, growing hypercube or the hyper, hyper, let's say volume, it's actually better if we go for the random sampling rather than going for the very, let's say, fine grained grid search. And I think, in my opinion, this is in fact the most widely used hyperparameter search algorithm in deep learning. <laughs> I mean, like the, and then you know, the, that says a lot about you know, the, our practice. You know, the, if somebody tells you that the, the best approach to solve an optimization problem is to randomly sample some of the configurations and then to choose the one that has the best subjective value, that means that the, the whole community has been a bit too lazy about it. So you know, the, of course, and then you know, the, because of that, more recently, people started to look into so-called sequential model-based optimization. So this is not a new concept. It's a, neither too old on concept, but it's a concept from the late 90s, where the idea is that the, is, if we are solving the problem of the black box optimization, wouldn't we want to actually have a model of this black box that gives not only us of the idea of how, what it computes, but also of what the model knows about this black box. If we know how to approximate what this black box would compute and know how much we are certain about this approximation, then we can be a bit smarter about choosing which points in the input, this hyperparameter space, we need to evaluate in order to maximize the approximation fit while minimizing our uncertainty about approximation. And then according to the uh, original description from 1998 uh, by John Seo, what we do is we come up, uh, they, they, we run the iterate, uh, iterative procedure. So we start from the randomly selected hyperparameter points. We're going to evaluate them by training all those models. And then we look at the validation loss. And given those hyperparameter configurations and corresponding validation loss, we're now going to fit a model to the underlying black box function. But this model needs to be able to not only fit this, uh, fit these values, but also give us the uncertainty estimate. And then once we have the uncertainty estimate, then we can now use a arbitrary but well-designed acquisition function to decide what are the next set of points that we need to evaluate in order to maximize the approximation fit while minimizing our uncertainty. And then the plots that you're seeing on the screen are showing the kind of toy example of what, what that means is that the this is an example where we have a single hyperparameter. So we're going to start by evaluating two points in this hyperparameter space. And then now we have a very nice fit of this black box, optim uh, black box function, but we see that the points that are far away from these two hyperparameter points, we have a very high uncertainty. 
Now, high uncertainty means that the, if we evaluate the point, we will be able to, we have a very, we have some chance of getting a very big gain. But of course, on the other hand, we also have a good chance of losing a lot because it's not going to give us enough gain. So what then, and then that actually gives us the idea of what kind of acquisition function could be used. And then one of the most popular one is so-called expected improvement. So how much can we improve our optimization, uh, optimization solution? And then you know, that has to be integrated over all possible values with the uncertainty taken into account. And then in 2015, Jasper Snook and others, who were, all of them were at University of Toronto back then, proposed to use the Bayesian optimization with Gaussian process to tackle this problem of hyperparameter optimization and deep learning with the sequential model-based optimization. And then it's really nice because Gaussian processes admit the often the exact computation of various acquisition functions. And then we know that Gaussian processes work well when we have a very small number of the labeled examples. So that one is often a detrimental thing when we think about machine learning in general. However, in this problem of model selection or the black box optimization, we, are, we just cannot evaluate too many. So we have to come up with a machine learning algorithm that, is, that are able to work with these uh, small number of observations. The Gaussian process just fits the bill very well. And more in recent years, uh, this Bayesian optimization based search algorithm or the hyperparameter search has also become one of the standard approaches because it has now been implemented as scikit optimized and can work with scikit-learn. So if you have any machine learning models that you need to train, and then if that model has some hyperparameters that you need to tune, I highly recommend you to use these two libraries in order to find the optimal solutions. And I can almost guarantee that you're almost always going to get a better solution than doing any kind of random search. So we've been making improvements. However, what we know is that the, we are not solving the problem of black box optimization because we know exactly what is the process by which learning happens that is dependent upon the optimization hyperparameter and then how that learning, the results of the learning maps to the validation loss. So it's not black box. In fact, we know exactly what happens inside. We wrote we built this black box. What that means is that we can be a bit smarter about it and then solve the problem for, for using a better optimization algorithm. And what, in other words, the model selection is not a black box optimization. When we say black box optimization, we mean that this inner optimization procedure is something that we don't know what happens. However, that's not true. We know precisely what happens. So we build now this as so-called bi-level optimization where we have the outer optimization loop and then the outer optimization objective function depends on the solution from the inner objective uh, optimization problem. And in deep learning, in practice, inner object of optimization problem is not even an optimization problem in some, in some sense, because first of all, uh, this is a kind of thing that I always tell my students in the intro to machine learning courses that the we never want to optimize perfectly because that's going to be the sign of overfitting. So somehow we are solving an optimization problem, but we are solving an optimization only to the point that we want it to solve. And what it means is that the, in fact, we are working often with a fixed computational budget. And then you know, the, we are saying that, yo, if we have run it enough while checking the validation error, and then if the validation error stops improving, we can just stop. So what that means is that it's really just a sum of all these stochastic gradients together with some complicated optimization routine. And then the interesting thing about stochastic gradient descent or the any kind of differentiable iterative update procedure is that the, the whole chain of updates itself is differentiable with respect to the optimization hyperparameters. So we we have the inner objective function. That is, I want to minimize the loss on the training set. And then to minimize this function with respect to the network parameters, we compute the gradient of this objective function with respect to the network parameter. And then we update the network parameter little by little. But then 
because this update that is delta on the screen is differentiable with respect to the optimization half parameter, we can go all the way, compute the validation loss function with respect to the final theta, theta hat here, which is a function of the lambda, the optimization hyperparameter, and then try to compute the gradient of this validation loss with respect to this optimization hyperparameters through this chain of gradient descent. In other words, we can compute the uh, so-called hypergradient or the hyperjacobian by backdrop through backdrop. And then that actually makes it really, really interesting because we know that the black box optimization is very, very difficult. But as soon as we have access to this very straightforward first order information about the function, the op optimization problem becomes so much more doable. And oh, this, I'm sorry, this is a typo. This is a venture 2000, not 2020. So Yashua wrote a paper in 2000 at Neural Computation Journal. And then there he actually had this insight and then proposed that we can use this gradient based model selection to find the hyperparameters directly rather than relying on black box optimization or pretty dumb grid, grid search. And then what the insight here is that the, because once we decided that we're going to use a gradient based iterative op, op, uh, optimization in order to so train a model, we can just collapse the outer and inner loops into a single op optimization problem. The objective function is just expensive to compute, but that doesn't mean that we cannot compute the gradient of the entire thing with respect to the hyperparameters. And then once we can write it like that, we can just use the same kind of gradient-based optimization to find the set of hyperparameters that's going to minimize the validation loss. This is pretty nice. Now, of course, there are a number of issues. And then the major issue is that it's very expensive. So if you imagine what we do in the stochastic gradient descent, let's just imagine applying one step of the stochastic gradient descent. I have a network parameter theta t, and then I want to get the theta t plus one by adding the gradient. And then when I add the gradient to this theta t, this gradient is the gradient of the loss with respect to this parameter. And then if I want to now compute the Jacobian of the network parameters at t plus one with respect to network parameter at t, because that's what I need in order to back probe through this process of SGD for each of the steps, now I end up with this Hessian of the loss function with respect to the network parameters. And then as you can imagine, this Hessian is going to contain a ele number, a elements that are as many as the square of the number of network parameters. I don't know if you have noticed, nowadays OpenAI and those big corporate uh, research labs are training models with 175 billion parameters. And the square of that is not going to be the thing that you want to compute nor store. So what that means is that the, although the problem itself has is conceptually straightforward, we can just use any kind of off-the-shelf gradient-based optimization algorithm we need some kind of trade-off. And then you know, the, the trade-off is inevitably bring in some kind of approximation that it makes the whole algorithm inexact. And that's what a lot of people have been working on since Yashua proposed this in 2000, and in particular re in recent years. So some people propose that, okay, we can simply truncate the inner optimization. So if the early stage of learning is important, perhaps we don't even need to train the whole thing. And then we just train it for a few steps and then see what the validation loss is. And then trying to find a hyperparameter that's going to minimize the validation loss with that small number of steps as much as you can. Kind of makes sense, but a bit unsatisfactory. Slightly more satisfactory solution is to rely on so-called implicit function theorem by starting the optimization procedure, train it all the way, but you don't, we don't back prove through it through this whole process of the learning, but use the idea, uh, use the implicit function theorem to compute the hypergradient at the point of the convergence and update the hyperparameter there. And then you can imagine this as a almost truncating the backprop to backprop procedure. And then of course, there's yet another way to do so is to make the iterative optimization or the inner optimization problem to be reversible so that no one, uh, we don't need to save all these as a intermediate values for the backprop through time. But all of these are a bit unsatisfactory, let's put it like that. So if you're interested in this, you can go read this paper by Lorraine L from last year. And then they have this amazing table that essentially enumerates all possible approaches that have been proposed to tackle this gradient-based uh, 
gradient-based hyperparameter optimization problem. But what you notice is that it's really unsatisfactory because we have to unroll the training procedure in order to tell how to change our hyperparameters, which sounds like the thing that we cannot avoid because you know, the, how, how will we actually avoid this unrolling unless uh, when we, our goal is to see what is the impact of choosing a particular hyperparameter on the final solution of this op optimization. But this, this, this thinking, this thought process is what makes many of these gradient-based hyperparameter optimization a bit less appealing in general, because we have to just unroll it. In other words, we have to train a model over and over nonstop. And then that's very expensive, right? So I mean, at the OpenAI said that they spent like two months training this GPT-3 on the potentially the largest scale ever compute that has been used for deep learning. No, we cannot really train multiple GPT-3s. That doesn't make any sense. That's going to be a huge waste of time. And furthermore, unfortunately, what that means is that the, we are finding the hyperparameter set that's going to work for this particular data set over which a lot of, let's say, training happened. That one is also not that uh, satisfactory. So this is what everyone is doing so far. And then now, finally, I'm going to talk about what we propose to do. And then in order to do that, we need to kind of, let's say, readjust our view of what SGD or the iterative optimization is by starting to view it as a recurrent network on its own. So I just drew a graphical illustration of what we do when we use the SGD. So we have the optimization state that is a network parameters, let's say at time step t minus one, so that's theta t minus one. We now compute the update that is the delta based on the current network parameter and the input that is the uh, mini batch at time step t. And then we have the optimization hyperparameter lambda. And then this is going to output the update direction and those two are going to be added to become the network parameter at time step t that is the new state of the optimization procedure itself. Now keep it in your mind and then we're going to go to the next page and then now we're going to look at what a recurrent neural net is. And then I can tell you, I think I know what a recurrent neural net is. And then this is the simplest and most thorough depiction of what a recurrent neural net is. We have the recurrent neural net hidden state at times that t minus one. So we have h t minus one. And then we have some kind of recurrent transition function such as LSTM and GRU that takes as input this current hidden state and the new input xt and compute the next hidden state based on the parameters theta. So here is theta is still the network parameter. And then we apply the same procedure over and over. Now let's go back again to the previous slide. Okay, and then come back. You notice that they look exactly the same because I actually used the exactly same plot, copied and pasted it, changed the color, changed the uh, notations only. What that means is that the, this kind of iterative optimization is really nothing but a recurrent neural network with the addit, uh, additive shortcut connection. And then in other words, gradient-based hyperparameter tuning over this SGD optimization hyperparameters is equivalent to training a usual recurrent neural network. So these two things are essentially the same thing. And this view of looking at it, uh, SGD-based learning of a neural network allows us to use all kinds of techniques that we have developed over the past decades or so for training a recurrent neural network. And there is a one really interesting thing called real-time recurrent learning in recurrent neural network. And if you're interested in real-time recurrent learning, I'm going to go into a bit of a detail, but if you're really interested in the super duper details, uh, you can check out the Marshall L 2020 there is a paper we wrote as a review paper of this real-time learning of the recurrent neural network. And then that was published at JMR just last year. It's uh, Mar Owen Marshall, the first author is a PhD student in neuroscience at NYU. And then he's done a phenomenal job at writing this paper that kind of summarizes and then put every variant of the real-time recurrent learning into a single framework. So I highly recommend you to take a look at it. So, Let's say, you know, let's go, let's take a step back and then let's now talk about just training a recurrent neural network. Now, training a recurrent neural net is also done almost always exclusively by the gradient-based learning. And then to do so, we need to first talk about the total loss of a recurrent neural network. So recurrent neural network 
consumes a sequence, so variable length sequence X, and then outputs a variable length sequence Y. And then the total loss is going to be defined as comparing this predicted sequence of output against the ground truth sequence output. Of course, if you think about the sequence classification, you can imagine that the every step, uh, this neural net is uh, outputting that the no decision, no decision, no decision, but only at the end is going to say, oh, this belongs to a certain category. Now, often this total loss is decomposed as the sum of the per step loss function, so L, and then at each time step, we, recurrent net maintains or the updates its own internal hidden state HT, and then based on which it's going to make a prediction, YT. And then we compare this prediction against the ground truth YT in order to get the per step loss function. And once we know how to compute the loss function, uh, everything in deep learning at the moment is quite straightforward. We just compute the gradient and we don't even compute the gradient ourselves. We're going to let PyTorch or JAX to compute the gradient for us. So what that means is that it's almost like the done deal. But the interest, this kind of sequential structure gives us a very interesting perspective. In fact, two views into computing the gradient of this total loss with respect to the parameters of this recurrent neural network. The first view of gradient computation is, we call it future facing view. If I look at how it's computed, there are two summations that are happening implicitly when we compute the gradient of the uh, lo a total loss of the recurrent neural net with respect to its parameters. One is that the, I have the prediction at every time step. So that's the outer, uh, let me see. That's the inner summation in this slide. But then there is another summation that needs to happen because we use the same shared parameters over and over. So we are essentially making a copy of the parameter at each time step, and then use that copy of the parameter. And then that involves uh, duplicating all these parameters as many times as the sequence length. And then later on, we need to sum the gradient that has been computed with respect to each of the copy. And then this just comes from the elementary calculus, but it's very confusing. I highly recommend if you haven't done this, do the exercise because only two years ago, I realized that the I was struggling actually writing this down because there were just so many indices, right? But then doing so gave us this sense that, the, oh, okay. So one way to go about is that the, we're going to have the outer summation go through the parameter copies while inner summation go through the loss, loss copies or the per step loss functions. And then when we try to compute the inner part of this outer summation, we notice that it's future facing because for each of the parameter used at time step S only influences loss in the future steps. Because you know, the, how I changed my parameter at time step S doesn't really influence what the per step losses were before because recurrent neural net only follows or the progresses along the temporal domain. Uh, temp temporal axis. And then this is in fact, how we compute the gradient of the recurrent neural nets uh, total loss using the back propagation through time. So at any point, we're going to propagate our signal forward into the future and then back propagate the error signal through time in order to compute the gradient. However, what you notice here is that you can also flip these summations and then make it into the Summation, so our summation is going to be over the per, per step loss function. And then inner summation is going to be over the copies of the parameters. And doing so, suddenly we notice that the, when we try to compute this one term for the outer summation, we are now pacing fast. Pa uh, facing past, oh, it's so confusing, but okay. So we are now facing past in a sense that the, in order to compute the gradient of the per step loss at time step t with respect to the shared parameter, we need to look at the gradient of the per step loss at time step t with respect to every single use of the parameters in the past. Because the, what, what happens to the future use of the parameters does not influence the loss per step loss in the past. So it's a kind of, let's say, viewing, uh, viewing the same computation from the opposite perspective. And this is a really amazing figure drawn by Owen that uh, shows us you know, the, 
why we can actually compute the exactly same thing, either being past facing or future facing. The really interesting thing here is that the by being by taking the perspective of the past facing gradient computation, we can suddenly start writing uh, train this recurrent neural network in an online manner. We can just update the parameters of the recurrent neural network as we receive new uh, token at a time. So usually what we do with the back propagation through time is every time we receive something, every time we receive some chunk, we need to prop, uh, compute for the future and then back propagate the error signal through time. But if we compute the gradient in this different way, then suddenly we can just compute the gradient, the per step gradient of with respect to the older parameters immediately whenever we receive a new input. And then we just update the network parameter, the recurrent parameter just a little following this gradient that has been just now computed. And this is really nice even further because it turned out that the, it admits a very simple way to compute this gradient. We don't have to store everything and then recompute by going back to the beginning of the time and then propagate the messages or anything like that. All we need to do is we need to rewrite this gradient. So per step loss functions gradient with respect to the full parameters as the product of two terms and then the first term is quite trivial to compute because this is just telling me if I change the hidden state at time step t, what would happen to the loss at time step t? That one we can always compute, it's just a feed forward computation. And then the second term, which is much more complicated because it involves trying to compute the Jacobian, that is trying to figure out what happens to the hidden state at time t had we perturbed the parameters that was used at every time step so far. It looks pretty daunting, but it turned out that we can rewrite it. It's a very simple, again, algebra, but unless you do it, everyone makes a mistake. I made tons of mistakes trying to see like, how it's derived. We turned out that we can actually come up with a very nice recursive formula that allows us to perform the fixed amount of computation at each time step, and then update this whole, let's say we call it influence matrix. And then this is really nice. That means that the, even if we have seen a very, very long sequence so far, the computation we need at each time step in order to compute the gradient that we can use to update the parameters, this computation is constant. So we don't have to worry about the length of the sequence that has been consumed so far. And this is what uh, is called real-time recurrent learning. This is obviously not a new concept. In some sense, it's just an algebraic manipulation of how we can compute the gradient of the total loss with respect to parameters in a recurrent network. But in 1989, Williams and Zipser did a very extensive, let's say, exposition of what it means to have the, such a real-time recurrent learning and then show that it actually works in the sense that we can train a recurrent neural net without having to use the back propagation through time. And it's relatively straightforward to write it down. Implementation is a bit tricky, but it's relatively uh, reasonably doable. So we first update the influence matrix. We compute the so-called immediate credit. That is what happens if we change the hidden state at time, current time step. Uh, what happens to per step loss at current time step? How we perturb the hidden state at the current time step? And then simply multiply them in order to compute the gradient that we can use to update the parameters on the fly. So unfortunately, it's not really widely used in practice just because it's very expensive. If we just imagine the memory complexity is O n cubed, where n is the number of neurons. And then as you can imagine, the one of those large scale recurrent neural networks, they tend to have 10, if not hundreds of thousands of neurons across the layers in total. And then we just simply take the cube, cube of that. I'm idea, of course, it's not going to work well. And then the, one of the reasons is that the number of the parameters is often in the order of the square of the number of neurons, right? Imagine having just a one fully connected layer, thousand neurons, thousand neurons. You have a, we have a million, that a million elements in the Wayne matrix. So that's how we end up with the size of this influence matrix to be the n times n square, thereby n cube. So not really widely used in practice. However, you notice that the, okay, so this is an issue because the number of the parameters is often the, on the order of the n square, 
well, what if the order of the parameter, number of the parameters is just O n, O one, so the constant, then suddenly, at least memory complexity wise, it becomes just as expensive as usual backpropagation through time because it's going to be simply O n, the memory cost. So that sounds quite promising. What can we do about it? And then this is where the online hyperparameter tuning comes in. So this part is going to be reasonably straightforward if you have followed me all along. Uh, so we now know that the SGD based learning is nothing but a recurrent neural net with the optimization hierarchical parameters as the recurrent neural net parameters. And then we, not, we now know that the, we can use the technique called real-time recurrent learning in order to train a recurrent neural net in an online manner. So we don't have to go all the way to the end and then back propagate the error, miss it, error signal. We can just update the parameters as we receive a new input. But then we learned that the, oh, wait, hold on, but the, this one is too expensive. When the number of parameters grows quadratically with respect to the number of neurons, Weird thing is that the, this recurrent neural net we built with the SGD does not have the number of parameters. There is a number of hyperparameters that scales with the number of network parameters. So what it means is that the, we often have a much fewer hyperparameters. So suddenly the RTRO becomes a pretty interesting alternative to the back propagation that has been used by all these gradient-based hyperparameter optimization algorithms. And then the interesting thing is that because we have already established that the SGD learning is nothing but a recurrent neural network, we can use real-time recurrent neural learning almost as it is. Only thing that we need to replace is that we're going to replace a theta with lambda and then H with theta from the exposition I gave you of the real-time recurrent learning just a few slides ago. And then that's what I wrote here. Essentially, it's exactly the same as before. Now, it all sounded pretty like they're rosy and everything, except that it turned out that that's not necessarily true because computing the, uh, computing the RTRL gradient still requires us to compute a very expensive Hessian or the Hessian vector product. However, the nice thing is that the, we only need to compute it once every time we update the pro hyperparameters. And then for that, it turned out that simply using a uh, stochastic approximation to the Hessian vector product, or you know, I refer to it as a permutator's trick, but it turned out the permutator's trick is another thing, but that can be, uh, is very much applicable and does not have a high enough variance so that the, it really can be used right away. If you're interested in this technique, you know, if Don't Care wrote a really nice blog post, which I highly recommend you to take a look at it. If you just type the Hessian vector product, Don't Care, you'll find this blog post on Google, like as the first entry. So, this is really nice now, you know, because we know how to compute the Hessian vector product very, very efficiently, well, with some approximation. And also the computational, computationally arterial is just simply feasible because the number of parameters, that is the number of the optimization, prim, hyper, optimization hyperparameters is often much smaller than the number of the network parameters. In other words, this is as expensive asymptotically as using the back propagation through time. However, we can now just go forward only. We don't have to wait until the neural net is trained and then trying to figure out what the gradient of this validation loss is with respect to the optimization hyperparameters. We can just go forward and then update the optimization hyperparameters on the fly. So this is the same slide I used to show you the steps involved in real-time recurrent learning for recurrent neural network. Only thing I changed was to update the parameters to the update the hyperparameters. And then the exactly same algorithm applies here as well. So two major properties that I want to repeat in order to emphasize is that it's fully online. We're going to update the network parameters as well as the hyperparameters simultaneously. And then it's almost exact in a sense that the computing the gradient of the total loss of recurrent neural net is exact as long as we don't change the parameters on the fly, but we're going to change it. But as long as we use a small enough meta learning rate, it's going to be very close to exact computation. So it's actually pretty good. It's almost like uh, the best of both world type of thing that's happening here. Yeah, but you know, the interesting thing is that in particular with the machine learning and then this kind of empirical field, uh, the kind of a say, 
theoretical or rigorous motivation or the justification of how well any algorithm should work well does not tell us that the algorithm actually works well and can scale well. So we ran some uh, experiments. We want it to be as uh, thorough as possible in terms of experimentation. So we use the small data sets, uh, which are MNIST and CIFAR-10. With MNIST, we use a full layer, fully connected neural network with the ReLU activation functions. And for CIFAR-10, we simply took ResNet-18 from Kai ming -Hu. And we use optimizer as uh, we use Adam as an optimizer, and then Adam has a number of hyperparameters: initial learning rate, uh, like beta zero, beta one, beta two, or something like that, right? So we're going to simply tune all of them with our approach. So first, uh, although you know, our motivation was to make sure that we make an online version of the hyperparameter tuning, which kind of doesn't exist at the moment. But we wanted to see if we use this for the offline hyperparameter tuning, would we get something interesting as well? Compa as, as opposed to black box optimization algorithms such as a random search and Bayesian optimization. So on this slide, you see the, both the number of trials that are needed and the wall clock time, number of hours that are needed for each of these algorithms to reach the target test loss of 0 0.3. And then what you see is that the Essentially, this proposed approach works. So for both set setups, we had to just run it once with our approach to reach the target loss, test loss of 0 0.3. And then that means that the wall clock time was substantially lower than all the other algorithms. While the random search as well as based on optimization, for every setting, they had to run many tens, if not more than hundreds of uh, trials in order to find this hyperparameter that's going to get us to get us below the target test loss of 0 0.3. And then, you know, like the, this slide, I, li I like this slide because you know, the, it does show that the Bayesian optimization is clearly better than random search. That's a good kind of confirmation to have. And that the, if we can go beyond the black box optimization, we can in fact do the much better and much more efficient optimization of hyperparameters. And we wanted to also look at the stability. That is, what if this approach is very, very sensitive to the initializations of the hyperparameters? That's going to kind of let's say kill the purpose of using this online hyperparameter tuning algorithm because we'll have to run another hyperparameter search to find the hyper hyperparameters of this online hyperparameter tuning algorithm. So what we did was to just randomly sample from a reasonably large range of the meta hyperparameters and then see how well it's going to converge to a certain value in terms of the test loss. And on both on MNIST and CFR10, they almost always find reliably a good hyperparameter set that's going to lead to a very low loss function, in fact, the te uh, testing loss. What that tells us is that it's very extremely stable and robust to the choice of its own hyperparameters, which is kind of the most important criterion that needs to be satisfied by by any hyperparameter optimization algorithms. And then the next interesting thing is that the, these black box optimization algorithms, such as the random search and basic optimizations, they all suffer as we scale up the number of the hyperparameters. It's just the nature of the black box optimization. There is a curse of dimensionality. And then because we don't know how this function looks like because it's black box, there's no way to avoid the curse of dimensionality there. However, because we're using the gradient-based optimization, we can largely avoid the issue of the curse of dimensionality, assuming that there is a very low dimensional structure behind the hyper uh, objective function landscape, which we know that it exists in general for most of the problems that we solve. And then here, what we did was to really like literally increase the number of hyperparameters by introducing new learning rate for each of the layers. And then we're going to evolve them separately. And then now we can group the consecutive layers to share the learning rate. And then by changing the size of the blocks, we can now control the, like get, have, gain a fine grain control of the number of hyperparameters, the total number of hyperparameters. And then what we see is that the more hyperparameters, the better test loss we get with the proposed approach. Of course, it does increase the wall clock time, but what this tells us is that the, this algorithm scales in terms of the optimization. So how well it solved the optimization problem. So we can now make a really perfect trade-off between the time and the quality of the final solution. 
But at the end of the day, the, our main purpose was to make an online hyperparameter optimization uh, algorithm that is able to adapt to the changes in the environment. That is, we want this algorithm to allow us to deploy a deep learning system that is able to adapt to the changes in the underlying data distribution or the changes in even the mapping itself. So, but of course, it, it turned out that the one of the reasons why uh, machine learning communities community hasn't worked too much on that is just it's not easy to come up with the artificial benchmark where we can actually test that kind of uh, setup. So what we did was that we couldn't find a nice benchmark for that. So we simply introduced artificial perturbation of the hyperparameters during tuning. So you know, as you can see, often the learning rate is going to go down in the early stage and then gradually toward a very small value to, to avoid any kind of overfitting. But then what we did was that the, in any arbitrary point, we simply increase the learning, learning rate to uh, let's say 10 times larger or the twice larger or something like that. And then this really does disturb learning quite a lot, except that the, our algorithm was able to rapidly recover from this perturbation. And then that was in terms of both the actual learning rate and also the test loss that was getting. What that means is that the, it really does know how to rapidly adapt to the change in the environments where the environment can be very adversarial as well. And then there are a few design choices that we need to make. So do we use a validation set or the training set for computing this uh, hyperparameter loss? Do we use a mini batches because you know, we don't want to use the entire validation set every time? If so, then you know, how large should the mini batch should be? And the conclusion is that yes, we should use validation set, which was kind of let's say obvious from the beginning. But what was less obvious is that yes, we can use mini batches, which makes it computationally very attractive. However, the mini batch has to be reasonably large. So we cannot use a mini batch size of 100, but using mini batch size of 500 is perfectly fine. But that's going to be a bit dependent on the problem itself. And then the final, so this is the final results from our experiments is that if, there's always the question, how much does the hyperparameters actually matter? Maybe they don't matter that much. Maybe all we need to do is just do a bit of a kind of line search for the learning rate every once in a while, and then maybe that's enough. And then the nice thing about this algorithm is that we can control how much, how much, uh, how much information is going to carry over and then use to update the hyperparameters. And then what we do is that we simply reset this influence matrix that is computed using the recursive computation to all zeros once a while. And then that's going to be the maximum length of the influence it can keep track of of the hyper optimization hyperparameters on the validation loss. And I was very worried about it because I was worried that the, if we just reset it every time, it's still going to work well. It turned out that's actually not true. As we increase this interval, we saw that the test loss, the final test loss gets better and better. And then the best case scenario was not to reset at all, which tells us that the, this online recursive update is in fact able to carry on or to carry over all these influences that goes long time back. In fact, the entire trajectory of learning. And then that's precisely what we want from this kind of gradient based optimization. And then this is one thing that got me really excited about this algorithm. So the three findings from the experiment is efficient, it's effective, and it's also resilient, which the third one is I think most important in the sense that the, it is the characteristics that we need in order to make this neural network or any kind of AI system to be really deployable and usable in practice. So let me wrap up. I have one minute. Yes, sorry about that. I should have left some time for QA. But so the uh, essentially how we arrived at this algorithm was that the first noticing that the model selection and training are both optimization problems. And then by using the gradient-based training, we can collapse them into a single op optimization problem. And then when we collapse it into a single optimization problem, and then notice that the internally there is the evolution or the forward pass of the recurrent neural network, we could actually see that the, we can treat hyperparameter optimization as training a recurrent neural network, and then could connect it with the real-time recurrent learning, which is a very, very old concept, and then bring it into the online hyperparameter adaptation. 
So it was a kind of interesting uh, exploration we did, and then you know interesting connections that we were able to make that spans uh, kind of let's say about three decades as well as the three continents, and it was a fun exercise. And what we see is that the, it works really well on these experiments that we have done, but it's just the beginning. There are a number of conceptual and theoretical issues that did not show up in our small scale experiments, but may become problematic in the future that need to be tackled. Two of them include the first, first overfitting to a validation loss. So when we use validation loss in order to simply evaluate a randomly selected subset of the hyperparameter configurations and choose, that's actually fine because we're going to in fact get an unbiased estimate of the minimum of the value. But when we start actively minimizing this value loss with respect to hyperparameters, we're going to get a very optimistic estimate of the validation uh, test loss, which is not good. But we haven't seen it in our small scale experiments, but I guess it might happen as we increase the number of the hyperparameters in the future. And second issue is that the RTRL, this real-time re recurrent learning, is asymptotically exact in a sense that the, in the limit of the tiny, tiny, let's say infinitely small learning rate is exact, but of course we don't want to use an infinitely small learning rate. So what is the right balance? And then is there a way to correct the inexactness that arises from the cho choice of a large meta learning rate? So that's, a, I think, the interesting thing that we need to study further. And then that does conclude my talk and thanks for listening. I hope this, despite the mismatch between the name of the seminar and the topic of the talk, I hope you know, it's going to, it was a fun and interesting uh, topic for you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your talk. It was really interesting and thought provoking. Uh, and it is very nice results actually, uh, not only theoretical, but also empirical. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the chat that I'd like to ask you. Nice. Uh, so they came up in the middle of your talk and I didn't want to interrupt. So uh, they might be related to the earlier part of your talk. I um, see. Kim is asking that when you're talking yeah. about random sampling, uh so are you using uniform distribution mm. yes uh, so yeah in the case of the i guess the random search for the uh, hyperparameter optimization so the random search often we use the uh uniform distribution over the log space and then you know, the there are some some let's say hand wavy reasons why we do so but most of them are really hand wavy <laughs> And then you know, the people do go a bit further than just simple random search only. They do the kind of, let's say, multi-scale random search and so on. But generally uh, using Bayesian optimization with the uh, appropriately selected kernels such as a matron three, four kernels tends to work better in general. Okay, thanks. And Laura Ditz is asking, so when you include the hyperparameters learning in the gradient uh, descent optimization, uh, wouldn't this introduce new hyper hyper parameters? Yes, uh, this is precisely like the, the most important question that should be asked. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, this is a great uh, point. It does indeed introduce more hyper parameters, but you, one can imagine uh, two reasons why we prefer to have this kind of thing is that the, you can imagine this as, in fact, reducing the number of hyper parameters in a hierarchical manner. So we start from the network parameters where we have millions, if not hundreds of millions of them. And then in order to solve the optimization problem in this high, high dimensional space, we have a small number of very low dimensional hyperparameters for optimization problem. But then what we can do is that we can now tune this using even smaller number of the hyperparameters. And then what we, and then this actually gives us a lot of, let's say, leeway in trying, trying more simpler or the more ex, uh, exhaustive search in smaller meta hyperparameter space. And second thing is that the, this is a bit hand wavy, but when we look at the hierarchical, let's say, modeling of the this Latin variable or the Bayesian models, what we observe is that the, as we build up this hierarchy, the sensitivity of our model's ability to model the distribution or the data to the change in the prior of the the very top level, let's say, Latin variables, goes down. So somehow, you know, there is a kind of let's say, it it does a, some kind of coarsening of the effect. And then you know, some mistake in the very high level hyperparameters or the hyperprior has less impact on the actual general modeling paradigm. So I feel like it is indeed uh, introducing more meta hyperparameters, but they tend to be smaller. Uh, there are fewer of them than the original hyperparameters. And then how the, 
a bit of a mistake in this meta hyperparameter is going to have less impact on the final model performance than a mistake in the original hyperparameter space. Can I ask a follow-up question? That yes, we have please. more questions in the loop. Hamid. Sure, okay. So I mean, so I mean this kind of like hyperparameter learning, it's sort of like, I mean, it's like an ancient old problem pretty much like everywhere in machine learning. And I remember like many years ago when I was working on probabilistic topic models, there were like, you know, techniques promised to learn the magical number of Ks of clusters that you need to have. Yes. And what yeah. happened in that sort of like the loss function went down, mm -hmm. but the quality wasn't any better. This is sort of like right. why people abandon that. And I think ultimately also, you know, with the base factor, right? Where you can sort of like, at some point you have to say, do you want to have, in which ballpark mm. do you want your hyperparameter to be? And yes. this question ultimately one needs to answer. I agree with you that, you know, applying mm. this hyper applying learning to hyperparameters and then turtles all the way down, it, right. there's, there's something useful there. But I think there are also like some implicit assumptions that you're making that, mm. for example, in terms of exploration versus exploitation, that yeah. your that your likelihood space is mostly mm. you know well behaved and doesn't have like extremely ragged behavior and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's a sort of yeah. like I, it, I'm not criticizing what you're saying. Right, I was yes. just wondering whether there's sort of like a different side to the story as well. Right. So this that's a really interesting point uh, because I, I have actually two things I can share with you. First thing is that the so let me see. Uh, I actually didn't mention it, but when we look at the experimental results of this online hyperparameter tuning, we often end up with a better test loss, lower test loss than running this offline hyperparameter tuning and then using the best hyperparameters from that one. What that means, it seems to suggest that there is some kind of beneficial coevolution between network and hyperparameters. What that means is that the, uh, we are not merely doing the hyperparameter search in the traditional sense. So if we view it from the offline hyperparameter tuning point of view, I believe that the our method is not doing necessarily better or you know, it is something more, more uh, fancier than what the existing ones are doing. However, from this point of view, the fact that the hyper our in our case, hyperparameters change together with the network parameters, that actually makes it a bit of in some sense we are solving a different problem. So these are all kind of, let's say, I believe for the future, but I think it's an interesting problem that so needs to be answered. Yes. That's, that's a great point, thanks. Okay, thanks. So the last question, uh, Nader has raised uh, hands. Nader, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, um, great talk. Uh, Thank you. I have a, a couple questions. Um, okay. The first is, is it, does it make sense to use this as a way to uh, potentially uh, modify the number of parameters. So could you do it as a pruning? For example, if your hyperparameters mm -hmm. were like, is this layer on or off? And mm -hmm. if you used like a straight through estimator for the binary on off switch, could you do it as pruning, for example? Yeah, so the answer is definitely yes. Uh, I would actually go for the just a policy gradient type of thing, like the reinforce algorithm, because I believe that they, what's important okay. for this kind of network pruning or the network architecture search is that the, we want to really look at a novel combinations rather than just a small, let's say, artificial uh, changes. So, but it's definitely possible. Now, the issue is that the, because our goal was the online adaptation, what that means is that the, we are not going to be able to try many different values at each time step. So then what happens is the estimate we get from any kind of Monte Carlo approximation is going to be extremely high variance. So what is the right way to control the variance is going to be a key, let's say, question. And then the, the other question, this is maybe on, on a different uh, sort of area, is how does this work with scaling the data size? So, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, I, I guess, discussion with OpenAI's work like you referenced. Yeah. And if you start scaling, the amount of data uh, that you're feeding to your model, um, you have certain scaling laws uh, that seem to come up, up, about uh, empirically. Mm. Um, mm. How would this relate? Right, I mean, the, so that's a really interesting question in a sense that the, when we increase the size of the data, there is a question of, are we actually increasing the data or is it just increasing a lot of noise? So, and then that's a key question here because Imagine that we are going to update the hyperparameters as well as the network parameters for using a small, not small mini batch sizes, right? Then what happens is that we are saying that the, for a small, uh, few consecutive steps, 
just looking at a fraction and fraction of the data is fine for us to adapt the parameters a bit, a bit so that it's going to work better in the future update directions. And then now that actually implies that the, if the, what is the right, not, right kind of intrinsic dimensionality of all these data sets so that we can use uh, small mini batch size. And then as you saw here already, when we use the global you know, idea of uh, online hyperparameter tuning, using a reasonably a reasonable size, let's say validation mini batch was important. What that means is that the, if increasing the data indeed increases the amount of information in it, then we may need to use a larger and larger mini batches. And then they might actually kill a lot in terms of using this algorithm on the fly. However, on the other hand, if you have a gigantic amount of data, doing any kind of hyperparameter search is kind of impossible. So then you have to, isn't it better to at least have some noisy version, noisy way to adapt the hyperparameters on the fly rather? So that's a kind of question. I, I hope that the open AI will be able to answer for us, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, King Yun, again for giving this interesting Thank talk. You. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. And the next CIR talk would be in two weeks by Laura Diaz, actually. Um, and yeah, hope to see you all there. Uh